Clancy Pasta Presents, I played a VHS board game called Don't Look Behind You and Nearly Lost My Little Brother. Written by 10 Minute Horror. We met once a month. It was always a Friday at our house. My younger brother Davey and I started a horror club with my two best friends Jeff and Brad. We talked our parents into letting us have the club on the last Friday of every month where we would inhale a few bags of chips, a couple bottles of coke and sprite, and watch three or four horror flicks. We'd also go over horror comics we'd read, the occasional horror board game or two. Anything and everything horror related. We were obsessed. The typical Friday would go that mom or dad would pick the four of us up from school and take us directly to Rogers or Blockbuster to go through the vast selection of VHSs to rent, though we'd spend the whole time in the horror section. There was a deal for five rentals for the weekend, so our parents would get one choice and we'd get four for the night. We'd watch one before dinner, then three in a row after. Davey and I shared a room with a bunk bed and had a TV and VCR in it, so Jeff and Brad would sleep on the floor on mom's yoga mats and we'd try to stay up all night, but we'd all usually be out cold by 1am. Stacy, our older sister, always came home around that time. I could hear her lame boyfriend Craig's car engine from several blocks away. Sometimes she'd come in and try to scare us. Once, she got Craig to climb up the side of the house and bang on the windows with a gnarly mask on. That sent us. I was usually the last one awake, and I'd stay up thinking about all the crazy stories and monsters we just watched. I'd rate them against one another on their scariness. If there were any snacks left, I'd finish them in bed, up on the bunk while looking back over the covers of the movies we'd rented. The next morning, we'd all have breakfast and talk about the different flicks we'd watched, and maybe re-watch the last one we'd fallen asleep to. Brad or Jeff's parents would pick them both up before lunch, and everyone's lives would return to normal, and I'd be left waiting for the next month to come. This Horror Club Friday finally came, and with it, Jeff had a surprise for us. But first the video store. We rented Creepshow 2, Fright Night, The Blob, the 80s one, and Tremors. I'd seen Tremors and Creepshow 2, but Brad and Jeff hadn't, and they were pretty fun movies, so we agreed on them. We started with those two, before moving on to The Blob, which none of us had seen, but all immediately loved. It was now 10.30 and Jeff was ready to break out his surprise. We'd all wondered what it was, sitting in a large garbage bag in the corner the entirety of the night. Jeff explained he was out with his mom at an old boutique-style bookstore, filled with antiques and ancient film reels, records, and a small VHS selection. He scanned through the VHSs, hoping for some horrors, but only found old classics. There was one, though, in a plastic case with a homemade label. It sat on a large rectangular box the size of a board game, which was what it turned out to be. When Jeff told us, we all got super excited. We'd heard of VHS board games like Nightmare and Atmosphere, but hadn't ever seen one or played it. Even though this one looked to be completely homemade, it had some frightening artwork on the cover. And when we opened the box to see the actual game, it was as thick as a cutting board, and just as heavy. The board was covered in zigzagging pathways, all stemming from one corner of the board and arriving at the center, where a pop-up structure of a cabin was marked with the word, Home. Since it was a four-player game, each corner of the board had a starting place, and we each got a figurine token for a playing piece. Each piece was small and metal, in the shape of a child, 
with the paint and colors smeared and faded. Each child's mouth was open in a scream. The four corners were all different, from a graveyard, to a forest, to a haunted mansion, to a slaughterhouse. The objective of the game seemed to be for each of us to get to the middle of the board, or home, from whichever frightening origin point we started from. A simple four-sided die with the numbers 1 through 3 pushed you forward, while the fourth side would send you one step back. Every path moved through other paths, like a maze, and interacted with its origin point surroundings. Whether it was a path through the forest leading to a dead end, or a hallway in the slaughterhouse into a meat locker, you had to pay attention to your path because of the other element to this game. While your player was trying to get home, there was an additional figurine that moved, on its own, across the board, trying to catch you. I read the back of the box, and it sounded like the inner workings of the board were filled with gears, similar to a watch. They were powered by negative and positive magnets, which were the individual pieces and board, and charged up whenever they were near each other. The villain figure must be more attracted magnetically to certain other figures, which would make the choosing of our pieces all the more important. But how could I tell? The VHS came into play, acting as a sort of hour-long timer counting down. If you didn't get home before the timer ran out, you were locked out. But you wouldn't be alone. The figurine that chased the players was in the shape of a dark cloaked man with long, stringy hair. As far as board game tokens go, he was the scariest one I'd ever seen. I didn't even want to look at him, which made the VHS that much more unsettling. That stringy haired man filled the screen, which was half covered by shadows. You could only really see parts of the side of his face and his eyes which were white as milk. When he spoke, it sounded like glass breaking. He introduced himself as the Harvester of Souls, and looked forward to getting to know ours. The Harvester welcomed us to the game, which was called Don't Look Behind You. He instructed us to take our places on the board as the timer was about to begin. It glowed in red at the bottom of the screen. One hour. We had one hour to get to the center of the board. We took turns with the die, each rolling and making our first moves. Brad started. He was in the dark forest. Then it was Jeff, who was in the graveyard. Then Davy, who had the slaughterhouse, and me, who landed on the haunted mansion. My first roll brought me three places forward, and the closest to home. My token was in a curving hallway, leading towards the staircase to the first floor. Then, the harvester's piece moved. Three places. It was going towards Brad in the forest. We all oohed and awed at the untouched token. The harvester spoke through the TV, asking if the player was afraid of forest. Brad, caught off guard, looked to us and shrugged. The harvester said he was about to be. Brad rolled again, a three. He landed on a card pickup. He nervously turned the card over and found an image of the young boy that was on his token. The boy was walking through the dark forest on a slim, barely lit path. The harvester was amongst the shadows, half his face lit by moonlight sprinkled through the trees. But his face, what we could see of it, wasn't that silky porcelain. It was bark-like, rotted wood. But his eyes were still white, and glared at the boy. At the bottom of the card, the words, Don't look behind you, were written. 
down on the board. We realized the harvester's token had moved and was now headed towards Brad. Brad got angry, though it felt more scared than anything. Brad stared at the card. I could see how uneasy it made him. He looked over his shoulder, checking behind him. Jeff called him out on it and we all laughed. Then it was Jeff's turn. His token was walking down a path between graves, but landed on an empty one, which meant he lost a turn. Then it was Davy, and he was making his way through the bleeding out room of the slaughterhouse. We continued on through several turns, with each of us making our ways through the frightening locations. The harvester was on the screen the whole time, staring down at us, watching. It really felt like he was. The one eye we could see seemed to track whoever was playing. I could even detect a smile here and there when one of us would choose to go left instead of right down a fork in our pathway. The harvester's token caught Brad in the darkest part of the forest. As it did, his voice came over the screen, announcing Brad was no longer in the game. Brad sat back in a huff. What a jip. His token tipped over. Jeff was the next one to land on a card pickup. To get through the graveyard, he had to walk through a mausoleum and landed on a bad square. The card showed Jeff's token walking through the halls of the mausoleum. One coffin had been pulled out of the wall, its lid opened. The harvester was peeking out from inside, half his face hidden by shadow. The visible half had been zombified, rotted and grotesque. At the bottom of the card, again, the words, don't look behind you, were written. Suddenly, Brad pointed behind Jeff and screamed. Jeff spun, panicking to see, but nothing was there. Brad was just pranking him. Jeff had turned, though, and looked. Down on the board, the harvester's piece was now turned towards Jeff. Within two turns, Jeff's token had been caught, and that frightening voice came over the TV again. He was no longer in the game. It was just Davy and I, now. I was nearing the front door of the haunted house, and Davy was almost out of the slaughterhouse. We were coming from opposite ends of the board, and almost in the safety of the home finish point. The harvester's next turn brought his token between mine and Davy's. He could reach one of us. The other would likely make it home, but one wouldn't. He decided to turn towards my little brothers. Davy rolled and landed on the final card pickup before the front steps of home. He lifted the card and stared at the image. It was his token, the little boy walking through the slaughterhouse. Behind him, the harvester had a chain metal apron on. He carried a large electric bone saw in his hands. He was covered in blood. His one visible milky white eye was aimed at the little boy in the image. And with that, the harvester's token was right behind my brother's. The voice whispered out from the screen, Don't look behind you. Davy screamed, spinning around and staring up at the TV. The harvester was looking down at him. A crooked smile formed. My dad knocked on our door, scaring us all even further. He told us it was time to go to bed. Davy snapped off the TV, vanishing the harvester's face from our visions just as he was beginning to outright laugh. We all decided to call it a night. We turned off the lights and I climbed up into my bunk. Davy was already under his covers only his face poking out. He didn't look okay. 
Jeff packed the game up and put it away. Then him and Brad tucked into their sleeping bags. The room was pitch black. All I could hear was four sets of hushed breathing. Everyone was still scared. I could tell we were all still thinking about the game. It really was creepy, and some of the things the harvester said felt personalized. I knew Davy had a fear of slaughterhouses. He'd seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in one of our first club meetings, and he still hadn't recovered. I also knew Jeff hated graveyards because of his grandpa's funeral, and Brad hated forests because he'd been lost during a childhood camping trip. But we were all scared of plenty of things, though. I knew I was just trying to scare myself now, and tried to think of the movies we watched. But my mind kept inserting the harvester's face and voice into my memories. Everything kept leading back to him. Then I got really nervous. I remembered one time when Brad had brought over a Ouija board for the club. It was kind of fun. I didn't really believe in it, but wanted to. I was thinking about the one rule Brad made clear we needed to follow when we finished playing the Ouija board. When we were done, we had to end the conversation. My mind took that rule and ran with what we just played. We never finished the game. I rolled over, looking out my window now. The wind was picking up and caused the light from the street lamps to flicker against the glass. My eyes picked up a shape. A human shape. In the shadows of our next-door neighbor's hedges, I saw a sliver of that porcelain skin. Then it was gone. Was that him? Had I seen the harvester? Uh, stop it. You're scaring yourself. Just go to bed. I rolled onto my back and shut my eyes. It felt like this was going to be a long night. I finally drifted off. The sleep was restless, filled with nightmares of long hallways with many doors, all darkened by the silhouette of the harvester. In my last dream, the static fuzz that accompanies the end of a VHS finishing its recording drifted in. Then I was awake in bed, laying on my back. I could hear the TV fuzz clearly. Someone had been watching something? I rolled onto my side and looked down. The TV was that static fuzz, but I saw Davy's foot, his Freddy Krueger themed socks, pulled through the TV screen. My heart stopped and I shot back in bed. I was pressed into the top corner of my room, unable to see the screen. I didn't want to. Had I just seen what I thought I'd seen? Was that actually his foot? I knew I saw his sock, but had it really been pulled through the screen? I gathered my courage and crawled back to the edge of my bunk and looked down. Jeff and Brad's sleeping bags were empty. Between them, the board game was set up. All the pieces were placed where we'd left off. I was so scared to look down and see what was in my brother's bed. Disturbing visions of the harvester. Stringy hair, long, gangly arms wrapped around Davy was all I could think of. But... I peeked under. His bed was empty too. I was the only one in the room. I climbed the ladder down from my bunk and inspected the board. The pieces were in the same places, but they were different. They didn't look like random little boys anymore. They looked like Brad. Like Jeff. Like... Davy, like me, we were all there. I reached out to pick up my piece, but 
felt a shock spark through me. The room got really bright, and I realized the TV screen was now inches from my nose. In the next second, I felt my body passing through something like a flurry of snow. Then a late November wind rushed overhead. It got dark. My face was pressed into dirt. I was cold. I got up feeling four walls of dirt around me. My eyes adjusted and I realized I was in an empty grave. It was about six feet high, but I could reach the top and pull myself up. I looked out and saw I was in the graveyard from the game. The same mausoleum sat in the distance, the one Jeff didn't make it through. Oh my god, I was in the game. I leaned against the wall of the grave, wondering how this could all be. What was I doing here? Then it hit me. Jeff was here, somewhere, in the mausoleum. If I could find him, maybe that was how I'd get out? Or maybe I'd be led into a trap. Either way, I didn't want to wait in this grave any longer. I climbed out. The grave beside me had a hole dug up through the center, like something had pulled itself out. The gravestone said, Harvester, 1691 to blank. I thought back to Jeff in the graveyard. While playing, his character had picked up a key in the rose bushes near the entrance to the mausoleum. It's what allowed him to get inside and try to leave the property. I needed that key. I set off across the graveyard, wind whistling between the stones and shadows taunting me. I felt like I was being watched from every angle, silhouettes of the harvester peeking out from behind tombs. I made my way towards the garden on the side of the mausoleum. It took me a few minutes of nervous searching, but I found a bronze key with a skull for the bow sticking up from the soil like a flower. I unlocked the back door of the mausoleum and entered. Slivers of moonlight highlighted the edges of hundreds, maybe thousands, of sealed coffins in the walls. The mausoleum all of a sudden seemed so much bigger inside. Crying echoed through the endless halls. It sounded like Jeff. I hoped it was. I followed the crying. It led me down several hallways before I heard it coming from the walls. I checked one of the seals and saw it had Jeff's name written on it. I pulled the handle and yanked the coffin out. There was thudding coming from inside, and the lid burst open, Jeff screaming and gasping for air. He hugged me when he saw me and I helped him out of the coffin. He was shaking uncontrollably and said the harvester had taken him and pulled him through the TV. The next thing he knew, he was stuck in that coffin. He was crying far too loudly, and the sounds were echoing through the halls. I quieted him down and told him we needed to get out the front door. We moved through one aisle, then another, and another. Finally, we were back in the main hall. I saw the front door way down at the other end. We rushed towards it. Somewhere behind us, the harvester screamed out, Don't look behind you. I felt Jeff's body shift to turn back, but I yanked him forward and told him to keep staring straight ahead. We kept running. The voice screamed out again, this time closer. We kept running and got to the entrance as the words bellowed behind us. We burst through the door and slammed it shut. Nothing followed. No banging on the door or screaming. Silence. 
We turned around to see we were now facing a wall of tall, dark trees. It was the forest. Brad didn't make it through. You could barely see five feet into the woods. It was just too dark. How the hell were we supposed to make it in there? Then Jeff remembered that there was a flashlight near the entrance to the woods. At the beginning of the game, Brad rolled a two and missed getting it by one digit. We could avoid that in person. There was an entrance a few yards to the left that led onto a path that disappeared a few feet in. We jogged over to it and found the flashlight sticking up from the bushes. It worked and gave us a larger window of vision through the woods. We moved down the path which was barely that. It was only about a foot wide and filled with gnarled roots and branches. We had no idea how we were going to find Brad but he was lost in the darkest parts of the woods. So, that's where we were headed. Jeff and I got to what felt like the middle of the forest. It was pitch black all around us. I stopped Jeff and turned off the flashlight. It was like our eye sockets were cut. Everything went black. Then, I heard crying. Brad's. I turned the flashlight back on, and we followed the crying. It got closer, but so did the sounds of twigs breaking somewhere behind us. I reminded Jeff not to look back, no matter what. Finally, my flashlight hit Brad. He was wrapped up in vines, which we had to break and pull apart to get him free. The twigs behind us kept breaking. We got Brad up and moving, and I hustled them down the path. I had no idea where I was leading them, but I hoped it would be to wherever my little brother was. A scream echoed through the forest. It was the harvester, saying he was coming to get us and to turn around and see. I yelled not to listen to him and to keep running. The voice kept yelling, getting closer and closer. We could feel his cold breath on our necks. Then, we all fell forward and slid across a slicked, tiled floor. We were all immediately soaked in a foul mix of innards and blood. We were in the slaughterhouse in what appeared to be a spare parts room, or maybe it was for bleeding out. All I could see were a million shades of red covering the walls and floor, and my best friend's pale, sickly faces in the midst. Bone saws of all kinds screeched out, echoing through the vast warehouse from some not-too-distant room. I could hear Davy's whimpers under them. I put my hand down to lift myself up and found it pushing into the stomach of what appeared to be a pig. Vomit rose in my throat. As I was pulling my hand out, I felt my hand grip onto something hard and handle-like. It was a large knife. I remembered back to Davy playing and just missing landing on a square with a blade he would have picked up. I threw up anyway but held the knife tight. Jeff and Brad got up with me, and we peeked out the doorway. The hallway looked to be never-ending, impossibly far into the distance, and lined with doorways. It was filled with small piles of body parts of animals and people. I saw the upper torso and head of a woman resting atop the body of a hog at the peak of one mound. The bone saws continued to screech out. It was almost unbearable, but I kept hearing Davy's low screams and yells under them. I rushed down the hallway, trying to follow the sounds. Brad and Jeff were several steps behind, clutching each other the way I did with a knife held in front of me. The screams got closer, but so did the bone saws. 
Don't look behind you, echoed out above them. It felt like they were going to be in the next room we passed, but I saw Davy instead. He was locked in a rectangular cage at the bottom of a pile of loose body parts. I rushed into the room, inspecting the lock to get my brother out. The key. I pulled it out and found it fit the lock perfectly. The cage snapped open, but as it did, the floor under it gave out. Davy and the large pile of bloody extremities fell, dropping ten feet and landing in what appeared to be... Oh no. They landed in a living room. The floor was old wood, rotting, the deterioration of a long abandoned house. I'd been in it only once before, but I knew it well. It was the old Wagner house and was said to be haunted. I'd been dared to go inside and retrieve a photograph from the master bedroom upstairs. The only way in was through a basement window that hadn't been barred and boarded up, so that's where I started. I'd gone through the basement, up and through the first floor living room, and to the staircase. The second floor, I didn't make it past the hallway. As I was walking to the master bedroom, the attic door hatch popped open, and the ladder leading up slid down. I turned and ran back downstairs and out through the basement. I never got the photograph and lost the dare. Now, here I was, looking down into the same living room. Jeff screamed behind me. The harvester was here. His voice shrieked into the room. Don't look behind you. I kept my eyes forward, grabbed Brad and Jeff, and pulled them over the lid of the cage. We fell into the living room floor of the Wagner house. I looked up and saw the harvester leaning over the cage. He pulled himself over to jump down onto us, but it all disappeared and became the ceiling of the living room. His voice echoed down to us, repeating those same four words. It all happened so fast, I didn't realize I was laying right beside Davy. He didn't either, so when I grabbed him and we locked eyes, tears overwhelmed us. I knew we didn't have much time though, so I picked us up and rushed Jeff and Brad to the basement staircase. We sprinted down into the dark cellar, squeezing between a massive ancient furnace and the wall. The window was just on the other side. It was a tight fit, but I led us through to the... Oh no, the window. The window was gone. It was all wall now. We were trapped. A metallic screech came from inside the furnace. It sounded like a series of sharp blades scraping across metal. We were going to die down here. The four of us. Trapped like rats. Wait, no. There was one other way out. I remembered it from the first time I saw the house. At the very top, under the highest arch, there was an attic window that was empty of glass or a frame. It led out onto a roof that could be easy enough to climb down. We just had to go upstairs to the... The drop-down staircase. The one that sent me running from the house a year ago. That was it. That was the way out. We'd have to go up it. The metallic scraping got louder. I yelled for the boys to go back upstairs. We squeezed back out as the furnace started to rumble. Heat began emitting from it, and the screeches got louder. Don't look behind you. We kept moving and got back up the staircase to the living room. We rushed back over the pile of body parts, slipping through the blood-soaked wood. Up the next set of stairs, I was leading with Davy's hand held tightly in mine. 
but I slowed down as we reached the second floor hallway. It was empty, quiet, and dark. The drop-down door was closed. Shit. We'd have to lift each other up to pull it down. I led the boys forward. Then, from the bottom of the stairs, the harvester's words yelled up. Don't look behind you. Our necks stiffened again, trying to contain the natural urge to turn. We continued on. Suddenly, the drop-down door swung open and the ladder shot down. We all fell into each other, collapsing backwards. As we did, I looked up into the small, rectangular doorway in the ceiling. Light from a window streaked across it. There it was, our way out. I pulled Davy up and yelled for Brad and Jeff to hold on tight. We formed a chain and climbed up the ladder into the vast attic. I could see the open window at the far end. It was still there. Davy tripped and pulled me down with him. My grip let out on the knife and it skittered forward. Jeff grabbed it quickly and him and Brad sprinted for the window. I got Davy up and made chase. Behind us, I could hear something large shambling up the drop-down ladder. It made me run faster. Brad and Jeff climbed out the window and reached in for us. I pulled Davy with me, but we both went through the window at the same time. I felt a cold hand wrap around my ankle. I looked down and saw the harvester's face glowing in the dark. His other hand was wrapped around Davy's ankle. He had us both. He was pulling, yanking us back down into the darkness of the attic. Davy's grip was loosening on the window, and I knew he wasn't going to last any longer. I let go of the window and slid into the attic, knocking the harvester's grip from Davy's ankle. I yelled for them to run. The harvester landed on top of me, his stringy hair blocking out any light from the window. He leaned down, opening his mouth to bite, when a sliver of metal slashed through the air. The harvester fell back, the handle of the knife sticking out of his neck. I felt three sets of hands grab my shoulders and yank me up through the window. Brad, Jeff, and Davy. They saved me. I stood up outside and looked to the other side of the street. I could see home. The windows glowed outward warmly. It felt so different than the rest of this world. We rushed out along the roof to the edge of the rotted shingles. One at a time, we climbed down the pipe to land on the grass. Jeff, Brad, Davy. My eyes were focused on the window. I kept waiting to see the harvester's face appear. Him climbing out and after us. But he didn't. It was my turn to climb down, but my eyes never left the roof. As I was halfway down, I heard the front door of the house slam shut. Oh no, he was outside. I threw the key down to Jeff and yelled for them to run. I jumped the remaining five feet and took off across the street. From my peripherals, I could see the harvester was near, but I didn't dare look back. I ran hard, but felt him gaining behind me with every step. That cold breath hit the back of my neck. Jeff and Brad were inside home now, and Davy was just entering. They were all waiting for me. I heard the harvester's voice whispering over my shoulder. Don't look behind you. I'm right here. I'm right here. I kept running up the front walk and to the door. I never looked back. The front door slammed shut behind me and cut off the harvester's voice.
I shot up in bed. We all did. I was on the top bunk, Davy was back on the bottom bunk, and Jeff and Brad were in their sleeping bags. We all had the same knowing and horrified expression. No one said anything, but we all knew. The harvester was on the TV. The timer was just ticking down to zero. His voice creaked out from the screen, disappointed, saying we'd survived the game, and to come back any time, if we dared. But to remember, don't look behind you. The TV went to static fuzz again. It stopped, then started to self-rewind. I jumped down from the bed and ejected the tape. I pulled all the film out and tore it to shreds. We packed the board game back up and snuck out to the garage where we grabbed a can of kerosene and some matches. We took the board game out to a park nearby and lit it on fire in the empty public pool. We left it burning there. The next morning, we all played it off like it was a bad dream. Even though Brad no longer had the large board game he'd shown up with. Him and Jeff left before lunch, and Davey and I agreed we didn't want a TV in our room anymore. So, we got rid of it. We now unplug the one in the downstairs living room every night. We've postponed the horror club indefinitely, and Davey and I are thinking of trying out baseball cards. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's tale, and thank you all so much for listening. If you liked it and aren't subscribed, I appreciate it if you would click that button, or follow if you're uh, listening somewhere else. Let me know what you thought in the comments below, and uh, make sure to follow me on Twitter, at ClancyPasta, and Instagram, also, at ClancyPasta. And I need to give a huge, huge, huge thanks to uh, all of my supporters on Patreon, all the way from the lowest tier to the highest. Your support helps out so much. I, I cannot thank you enough, and uh, I should have some footage playing of uh, what I'm going to be sending out to my $25 plus Patreons in just a couple days, which is some personalized uh, sketches on paper straight from my hand to the pencil to the page. You get a nice little uh, a doodle. Maybe it's not too nice. Maybe it's just a doodle. And you get a homemade print of a little painting that uh, that I did. So. Uh, I, I printed, I scanned the painting in and printed those prints off myself, and uh, so if uh, the patrons I send it to like it, then maybe I'll, uh, I'll send out either the same print next time or uh, another one. But okay, it's time to uh, give a huge, huge, huge thanks to all of my $5 and up supporters. So thank you so much to Gabriel B, Galaxia XP7, Jacob D, Jacob S, Jamie P, Michael L, Sky Mara R, Christopher P, Lydia P, Suzanne G, Rebecca H, Tim W, Ryan T, Folor, and Tumultuous Tay. Thank you so much uh, for your support on Patreon. It means uh, so much personally and and just for supporting this podcast. And uh, I should have said this earlier, but huge thanks to the author for uh, for letting me narrate their tale. Uh, this one was was just great. It had such a, a great classic um, vibe to it and uh it, it was just fun these are some of my favorite kinds of stories so without further ado thank you all so much for listening i hope you enjoyed and uh i will see you all on the flip side cheers <laughs>